Hi, teacher. Hello. <laughs> They're all busy saying, hello, Grandpa. Hello, Grandpa. <laughs> hello. <laughs> that second number that those children just sang was written by my wife, and she taught our children to sing it when they were little tiny kids. And Anastasia and the others remembered it. It is so delightful to hear the voices of little children singing the praises of God about how Jesus died and rose again. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died for me. What a wonderful, wonderful thing for the children to learn when they are still tiny little people. You know, Daniel and Stas especially have been able to be here several times, and um, these little boys here, they have five little boys aged three and under. Think about that. Five little boys aged three and under. I had the privilege of going with them to China when they adopted those two little sweethearts that are wiggling around in the front pew over there. And um, the last time that they were here, those two little boys said to me, I love Jesus. <laughs> so what a delight to know children are being raised in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. I'll make my message as brief as I possibly can, but I want to share with you two passages. The first is our text for today. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Very appropriate for a funeral, for one who has served and loved the Lord Jesus Christ all of her life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That was not merely for Paul, that is for you, if you look forward to the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. To all them that love his appearing. The second portion of text that I would like to read for you, which fills that out for us, as we look at this dear beloved woman, is Proverbs chapter 31, beginning in verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Oh, how I love verse 12, which follows, She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. How I know that to be true. The wisdom that God gave to Solomon concerning the godly wife. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. You heard some of the children give testimony. She taught even the boys how to knit and sew and crochet. She taught the boys even how to make bread from scratch. We would buy a thousand pounds of flour a year in Amish country and store it in clean garbage cans and she taught them how to break, bake bread from scratch. She's a Proverbs 31 woman. She will do him good. She will do him good. She seeketh wool and flax. She worketh willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. 
We were living in North Jersey at that time as we were bringing that in. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. My wife and I would rise every morning at 4.30 in the morning. It was the only time of the day that we weren't having phone calls, interruptions, some kind of chaos, as you would guess with a family of 13. We'd rise at 4.30 in the morning to pray. From the time that we were engaged on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, we rose every morning to read the scripture together and to pray. And we always prayed for at least an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, until this past week. People, the thing I will miss about her the very most is she was my faithful prayer partner. We prayed for every person in this church. We prayed for every one of our children. We prayed for every one of our grandchildren. We prayed for every missionary that we knew. And most of you don't know who those are because we're praying for people whom we've known for 40 to 50 years. The prayers on Saturday morning after she had gone to be with the Lord just a few hours before, even though I had not slept until 4.30 or 5 in the morning, I got a little tiny snooze and then I woke up with a start. It's time to pray. And I reached over and she wasn't there. Do you have that kind of relationship with your spouse? Or the most important thing that holds you together? As you draw closer to the throne of God, you are drawn together. She was a woman of prayer. Oh, I loved her fellowship. I loved her for all the happy times we had together. I even loved her through some of those meals that some of the kids mentioned. <laughs> I loved her. But I was most closely drawn to her as we prayed. That is when I knew that our spirit was united before the throne of God's grace. The one I loved, with whom and for whom I prayed. She considereth the field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hand. She planteth a vineyard, and the children can tell you all about all the gardening we did in Alabama. She girdeth her loins with strength. She strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle. Her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She was always willing to have people into our home. She was a woman who loved to share what God had given to us. Our home was not a fort. It was not a castle into which we retreated. Our home, she made it this way, was a place where we would bring people in so that we might share with them the good things that God had done in our lives. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. You probably saw that beautiful pink dress that she was wearing this morning. You'll see it in some of the pictures over here, her favorite dress, delicate, ladylike. She loved to sew years ago when we lived in North Jersey. An old sewing machine factory was going out of business. And they had all their old, heavy-duty 
sewing machines for sale. The ones that have a leather belt that goes all the way around down to a motor that is underneath a table that is literally two inches thick. Cast iron, heavy duty. And she wanted one. And I wasn't so sure, but I bought it for her. That sewing machine is still upstairs in our sewing room. And my wife and daughters use it today. She loved to sew. She made clothes for every one of the children you saw up here as adults today. She sewed their clothing. She patched their clothing. She stitched their clothing. She was a Proverbs 31 woman. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. I don't deserve that. But she is the principal reason why God in his grace brought me to this church. This is an historic church. This is a church where a great man of God, Dr. Carl McIntyre, preached. This is a church which has had an impact around the world. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles to the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. And you just heard testimony about verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. Oh, how much wisdom she imparted to these children. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. You just heard it as they bore witness to the truth of those words. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. She wasn't one of these get about socialites who flit and fly from one exciting thing to another and hope they're impressing people as they do it. She was never idle. She was a woman who worked hard, who worked diligently, and who set an example so that you who know her would know what you, especially you women, should be like. She exemplified for you if you have any question about it, what Proverbs 31 requires of the godly woman. Her children, and you've heard it, arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her, and I do indeed. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, that was central to her life, a woman who feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. When Judy and I married almost 42 years ago, we gave each other wedding bands. Not merely wedding bands, not merely inscribed with our names, but wedding bands inscribed with scripture. And on my wedding band it reads, out of the book of Leviticus. You say, what a weird book to choose for your wedding band. Leviticus 16.2. It's a very short phrase. It is God speaking. He says, Be'anon erae al hakaporet. In the cloud I will appear on the mercy seat. And at the end of that phrase on my wedding band is engraved the cross. 
in the cloud, I will appear on the mercy seat. The cloud in Leviticus 16 is a description of the Shekinah glory. The mercy seat was that gold top of the Ark of the Covenant where the blood was sprinkled and where God met with his people through his great high priest. The New Testament picks up the theme. It tells us that Jesus is our Elasterion, our mercy seat. It's the only place where God meets with his people. And Judy's ring had an inscription also. When she went to be in the presence of the Lord, I was holding her hands, bending over her and giving her a kiss. And I looked at her hands and there was that beautiful ring that I had given to her nearly 42 years ago. She never took it off. We had promised that we would love one another unto death. Her hands were small, the ring tiny. But on her ring was engraved Yahweh Yeshuati. That's a play on words in Hebrew. It means two things. Yahweh Yeshuati means Jehovah is my salvation. But Yeshua is the name of Jesus. It can be translated, my Jesus is Jehovah. And on each side of that phrase in Hebrew, there are two crosses, one here and one here. And Jesus is in the middle. Dear people, we wanted everything in our life. Oh, we failed miserably, I know that. But we wanted it to bring glory to Jesus Christ because the marriage of husband and wife is to reflect the marriage of Jesus Christ to his bride, the church. That we might give testimony by the very thing that we wore on our hand, our hand which belongs to God, a hand which last Friday God reached down and took her hand from mine and lifted it up and said, Sweet Judy, I've finished preparing a place for you. Come home with me. And she released my hand and took the hand of the Savior and entered into his presence to the place prepared for her. For her alone. Magnificent beyond anything that any of us could comprehend in this life. You know, we pondered many nights before the birth of each one of our children so that we might give them names with meaning that would bring glory to God. We didn't give them family names. We did not give them currently popular names. We did get not give them names merely because they sounded good, because most people think those names sound weird when they hear them the first time. We gave them names so that the first and middle name, when combined, would utter a statement about the God of heaven whom we worship and adore. One of the children mentioned how much my wife loved Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. She constantly had it with her. And she'd have her Hebrew Bible. And what you saw today as you looked in this casket here, what was in her hands, was a small Hebrew Bible that she purchased in Israel. And she read out of it every day. And she marked the two places where she was reading. And where she was last reading was in the book of the Psalms, 
and in the prophetic book of Ezekiel. And so I've placed it in her hands. It was the one thing that she would want to hold on to. The Word of God. Do you love the Word of God that much? My wife loved the Word of God. She loved it more than even she loved me. And I'll tell you for that I am thankful because that is what made her the wife that she was. And that is why it is with her in that casket. She being dead yet speaketh. Oh, dearly beloved, hold on to the scriptures. That's what speaks of Jesus. And he is the one in whom is eternal life. Yes, that's why we gave them their names. Do you understand why I call Judy the most godly woman I've ever known? Why I call Judy a virtuous woman beyond compare? There are so few women at any time of history that reflect Christ in the way that she did. She went home to be with Jesus on the 14th. And I spoke with Nehemiah on the phone and he said that his immediate thought was, you know, that's how many children God gave to us. Today you've seen 13 of them. But you see, we have a little child that we lost before birth. We didn't talk much about that child. So Judy has now had the joy of getting to meet one of our little unborn children before I do. The right of a mother to know her child and to rejoice in the choice that God made for that child. What a joy to know the little child who never had to suffer the things of earth. Judy is the first of our immediate family that gets to see her dad in glory. She's the first of our immediate family to be set free from the curse of sin and pain and the shadow of death. You've heard it testify, Judy loved to excel. She loved to achieve, as her academic record shows. She never wanted to settle for the easy way, the mediocre way, or the way of compromise. She gave her heart both figuratively and literally for those whom she loved. I want to tell you something else very personal and very important to me. This is very personal. As a man kisses a woman and as a woman kisses a man, she was the only one I ever kissed, and I was the only one that she ever kissed. Young people, that's the way God intended it to be. Keep yourselves pure. And so at this point, I have no regrets. Only joy that God gave me his very best. God ordained her for me from eternity past, and God ordained me for her from eternity past. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Today, I begin the process of burying my best friend on earth. Yes, we had the passionate love of husband and wife, but Judy was my best friend, my best friend.
as I think about her. How she poured her life to teach her children excellence, to maximize their potential, to do all for the glory of God. She kept after them, and you've heard about how she kept after them. And God blessed her diligence. Today, as you saw her in the casket, you saw a string of beautiful pearls around her neck. I had the privilege of going with Daniel and Anastasia to China when they adopted those two sweet, dear little boys, Shouhui and Jen Ho. And you see their names written in the, bill, uh, the bulletin, but I bet you can't pronounce them just by looking at the way they're spelled. <laughs> two precious, precious children. And while I was in China, I thought of my wife, and I remembered what Jesus said about the pearl of great price and how a man would sell all that he had that he might obtain the pearl of great price it's merely a small token but Judy was a pearl of great price you know on Thursday night I had the privilege of taking her out to eat. We never go out to eat except a Burger King. <laughs> but that night, God somehow motivated me to take her to this very, very lovely, expensive, and you know how tight I am, I'm a Scotsman, <laughs> restaurant. And we delighted in each other's company. There were some other people there that we got to meet that Oh, she was vivacious and broke the ice and we had lovely conversation with them. But as I held her hand, as we had dinner together, as we looked at each other, and had that joy that comes from knowing that you're with someone who loves you. What a gift that God gave to me. Little did I know that 24 hours later, she would be in the presence of our Savior. You know, it's uh, interesting as we uh, looked at her today, it crossed my mind once again. She would be in 65 years old in two weeks. But you saw her hair coming down over her shoulder. She grew that hair for me. When I met her, she had shoulder length hair. And you can see that in our engagement picture, which is on the table over there in Fellowship Hall. And you see her next to this funny looking scraggly guy with a really bushy beard. <laughs> but you know, from that day forward, she never cut her hair because she knew how much I loved it. Oh, many times it was so painful for her because hair that's down below your waist, and the ladies know this, is very difficult to care for. But she grew that hair because she loved me and she honored me. And you know something? God blessed her for that. If you looked at her hair today, you saw no gray hairs in it. Now, 13 kids will give you gray hair, <laughs> but there was no gray hair there. And I believe that God honored her for her submission and love for her husband by making that beautiful hair, which I loved so much to stroke to put my fingers through as I drew her to me. He kept it golden blonde. Oh, dear people, that was a gift to me from God through my wife. You know, as she was passing away, and as she was entering eternity, and after she had gone, 
and we were still there. I stayed in the hospital till four o'clock in the morning. The doctor's reports say that she went to heaven, though they don't use that term, at 10.01 p.m. We'd been there since 3.30 in the afternoon. So after six hours, the nurses asked us to please leave. And I so much wanted to hold her one more time that I leaned across and cupped her head in my left hand and placed my right hand underneath her and behind her back to hold her and give her one last kiss. And her back was still warm. And I gave thanks to God that he gave me one more opportunity to hold in my bosom the woman who had given me warmth through our entire married life. It was a gift from God. Dear people, your preacher is a very weak man. And he has just lost what God had given to encourage him and to strengthen him. I know I'll see her in eternity. I know the theology. But people, and you many have gone through it, now it's the experience. Is your theology true? And we know, without a shadow of a doubt, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that is the only reason that you and I have hope. Because Christ rose from the dead, Judy Spencer will rise from the dead. Because Christ rose from the dead, Christian Spencer will rise from the dead. Because Christ rose from the dead, you will rise from the dead. The question is, which resurrection? When you stand face to face with Jesus Christ, he will either be the one who is your savior, or he will be the one who is your judge. What have you done with Jesus. I hope you ask yourself your question, that question in your heart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You know, as she was holding my hand in the hand of Jesus, before she left, the doctor said we can't do anything else. Her heart was still giving some flickers, but the aorta that runs from her heart down to her kidneys, that main aorta over the front of the heart, had ruptured from the top all the way to the bottom. And as her heart was pumping, the blood out into her abdominal cavity, the heart continued to try to pump, but it was becoming a dry pump. And I called each of our children on the phone and I said, Ema's dying. Do you want to tell her that you love her and do you want to say goodbye? I was able to reach almost every one of them. And I held the phone to her ear, and I could hear it a little bit, and hear how they poured out their hearts of love for this beautiful woman, and how they each told her, Goodbye, Ema. We love you. And when I could reach no more, I bent over her and whispered in her ear.
but I did not say goodbye. I said what we always said to one another before we went to sleep at night. I said, good night, sweetheart. I love you. I'll see you in the morning. And she would always respond to me, good night, sweetheart. I love you too. And people, I will see her in the morning. There is coming a morning of glory when we shall be in the presence of Christ, the one with whom we loved and drew closer to each other in prayer each day, and we will be in his presence together. Oh, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know him or just know about him? I knew my wife. My wife and I knew Jesus. He's the one who kept us going. You all know that we are both dominant people. Dominant personalities, type A types. And so there's always the, the possibility of friction and tension and break up. But Jesus was the bond that held us together, not merely flimsily, but with the greatest bond of love that you can imagine because it was the love of Christ. I have no complaints, no bitterness in her going. Some people are bitter when they lose a loved one. They say, why didn't God leave this loved one longer? I loved them so much. I needed them so much. Dear people, I have felt no bitterness. I have felt no anger. No accusations against God. Why did you take her at such a young age? We had hoped that now that our children were pretty much grown, that we would be able, after Grandma goes to heaven, of being able to retire and enjoy one another. The woman whom I loved and the man whom she loved, to be able to relax and do things together, to express our love. But God's plans are not always our plans. Do not hold God accountable when he has a plan that is better than the plan that you thought you had. No, I do not have bitterness. What I have is thankfulness. What I have is thanksgiving that God gave her to me for 42 years. Oh, what richness. Oh, what delight. Oh, what exquisite pleasure as we lived life together. Do you know what it's like? Oh, I hope you do as a husband and a wife. You know, the Lord brought to my mind many passages of Scripture, but he also brought to my mind the quotation from Shakespeare. And you say, that's a weird thought. No. It's this. And I whispered it in her ear. Good night. Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Sleep to thine eyes. And I touched her eyes. Peace to thy breast. And I touched her breast. Sleep to thine eyes, peace to thy breast. Would I were sleep and peace so sweet to rest. Oh, people, do you understand how I love my wife? The greatest gift God gives us here on earth besides our salvation is the love 
that a husband has for the wife and the wife has for her husband. Yes, God's love always has to come first. But then God gives you, if you will take it, a love which is beyond compare. God changes plans. We need to let him be able to do that. God changes plans. We need to let him do it. The Sunday before she died, I preached a message entitled, Death, Doors, and Direction. How death is used by God to change directions in our lives. Little knowing that in less than six days, God would burn that lesson into my soul. On Monday night, a trustee meeting, I had no knowledge that death was coming for Judy. On Tuesday night, we went to the Women's Missionary Society and we brought her mom along. And on Tuesday night, I had no inkling that death was coming for Judy. On Wednesday night, we came together to prayer meeting and also brought Grandma with us and afterwards session meeting and I had no knowledge that death was now coming in just two days for Judy. On Thursday night, God gave us that wonderful break where we went out to dinner together and had that wonderful beautiful dinner and you know I want to tell you how callous I was at one moment because she had gotten all dressed up she was wearing her favorite shoes and they're with her in the casket today and she said oh let me go back and get that pearl necklace that you gave to me when you came back from China and her this crass husband said, sweetheart, we're running late. That's why it was on her today in the casket. She wanted to wear that necklace at least one more time. People, do you understand? That was Thursday night. Little did I know that in less than 24 hours, Death would take her. When we went into the hospital at 3.30 in the afternoon, I was busy, but I knew God wanted me to take her to the hospital. I assumed when the doctor said, we want the cardiologist to look at these CAT scans tomorrow, I'd like to keep you in the hospital overnight. I had no idea But in less than four hours, she would step into eternity. When the doctor, who was the admitting doctor, came in and filled out all the paperwork, we had a wonderful time. She was feeling very good at that moment. They'd given her the nitroglycerin under the tongue, the vascular dilator that made everything flow more easily and more smoothly. We talked with him, and she was very animated in her talk. She found out he was from Missouri, and I have an uncle who's in Missouri, and we've visited him, and she loved it in different parts of that state. And so we had a very pleasant conversation. And he finished, and he filled out the paperwork and walked out, and she was a little bit thirsty. I gave her a drink. We talked together and held hands. And I was thinking, well, I probably don't need to stay here in the hospital tonight. She seems to be doing fine. We'd only held hands about two minutes, maybe three minutes. And suddenly she said to me, Abba, I don't feel right. And her head tipped back and her eyes rolled back and her mouth opened and these horrible sounds began to come out 
And I rushed 10 feet to where the nurse's station was and I said, my wife is in distress. And immediately they came. They jumped up. They moved to the room. I called Ariel. He's a surgeon. I handed the phone to the doctor that was there in the emergency room. They spoke with one another about what was going on. They gave her the paddles. They gave her the, the chest compression. They squirted in the epinephrine. They squirted in all the other things. 20 different tubes that were left there afterwards. And the doctor, after speaking with Ariel, said there's really nothing else we can do at this point because that artery had ruptured. And so they left. And that's when I began to call the children so that they could say goodbye. Oh, they'll say good night too because they will also see her in the morning because she raised them in the fear of the Lord which is the beginning of wisdom people are you ready some of you who are here today as Ariel mentioned in his little testimony some of you who are here today may not make it home some of you who are here today may live one more week some of you may live a full long lifespan, but at some point you will step into the presence of Jesus Christ. In a group this size, there's almost always someone who is not saved. You know what my prayer was when I realized that Judy was gone? The first cry of my heart, and I cried it out loudly to the Lord. Oh, Lord, in her death, let someone come to Christ. Let someone come to Christ because of who she was living for Christ. You see, that was the cry of both of our hearts. That God would irresistibly draw to himself someone who did not yet know the Savior. And that's that's what I have asked God for from this. I didn't ask him for a few more minutes or a few more hours. I asked him that through her death someone would come to Christ. Oh, how it drove home to me that every minute of life counts and how slothful I have been in so many areas of my life and how much more zealous and diligent I must be for I may soon also join her and give an account for what I have done in this body you will too dear friend if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior know this Jesus died that you might live Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus was buried in a stone cold tomb and guarded by the world's best soldiers. But the bonds of death could not hold him. And as prophesied by the word of God, which she loved and which she has in her hands, Christ arose. That's the guarantee that the Father was satisfied with his death. It was an infinite death. And if you trust him, he'll save you. Is there someone here today who does not know for sure that they themselves, at the moment they step across the threshold, will enter into glory? You know in your heart, I don't know. You know in your heart, and God knows in your heart. What have you done? with Jesus. In a moment we're going to pray. 
And as we do, the Bible gives us the promise that if we trust in Christ who died for our sins, who was buried, who rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that God, and he always keeps his word, will give you the gift of eternal life. You have before you a woman who, as we have read in 2 Timothy 4.7, can say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord shall give unto me, and not unto me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. He's coming back. He's coming back. Do you look forward to it? Do you love his appearing? Do you want to see Jesus? Or are you a little bit shaky about that? Unto all them that love his appearing. As we pray, all you have to do is say, Lord, I'm lost. I'm headed for hell. But I know Jesus died for me, and he rose from the dead, and I believe it with all my heart. And someday I want to be in that place of glory where I know that Judy Spencer is now. You can do that today, right where you sit. You don't have to speak out loud, but you need to make that choice. And you will make that choice today. You will. Either you will trust in Jesus or you will decide not to trust in Jesus. You will make a choice. What will you do with Jesus? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the life of Judy Spencer. I, more than anyone else in this room, can thank you for that. For you used her as an instrument to mold and shape my life, to teach me things that I guess only a married man would be able to learn. And you used her graciously, and you used her consistently, and you used her faithfully. You gave me a wife who could look at me after the sermon and say, you told them it says this in Greek. Do you know that's not what it says? <laughs> Oh, Lord, how I loved her, how I love her, how I thank you for her. Father, but in this hour there's also sorrow. And I pray for each of my children, for each of their spouses, for each of our dear, precious, precious grandchildren, that you'll bring comfort to the heart of Natanya, to Ariel and Bethany and dear little Zachary, to Philemon and Robin, to Laura and to Summer, to Abigail, to Kathleen and Joel. Pray, Father, for your mercies on Nehemiah and Pamela and Elliot and Lincoln. Pray for your mercies upon Theo and Mingsum and their dear little William. Father, I pray for your blessings on Daniel and Anastasia and these five dear little boys wiggling around here today, which brings such joy to my heart. For Dietrich and Eric and Shohei and Jen Ho and Patrick. I pray for your blessings on Elijah and Martha. For dear Evangeline and her fiance, Jorge. For dear Amana and her dear friend, Nirmal. For Sebastian and Kayla, and dear little David and Kaylee. For Isaiah and Anatoly, and dear Megali. What a joy she was to Ema. The last treasure you gave us, though we prayed for more, Father, I pray for Stan and Joan and for their family, for Rick and Molly and their family, for Nathan and Charlotte and their family. 
I pray for Grandma Wren, who is only partly understanding what has transpired. Father, I pray for all of the others who are relatives at a farther distance, for the uncles and aunts and cousins and nephews and nieces. I pray for those here who are her friends, who are also an encouragement to her as she was to them. But Father, all of us who know Christ pray together as she often prayed for those who are here who are lost, who at this moment are struggling whether or not they will trust Christ. That you would open their hearts, Father. That you would cause them to see the suddenness and the, the quickness of death. We have no guarantee that tomorrow will be here for us. Oh Lord, there was someone this past week who said, I'm too young to make that decision with whom I spoke personally. No, today is the day of salvation. Trust in Jesus alone, and he will give you eternal life. Father, we pray for those people even now that they would be saved. Let that be an answer to my prayer as you took Judy to heaven, that someone through this would come to Christ. Father, we thank you. I thank you with all of my heart for this one whom you gave to me and whom I love and to whom I have had to commit her back to you. And as we sung in those three hymns on Sunday, two days after her death, hymns that were chosen months ago without any knowledge of this event. You spoke to me. Jesus calls us, and in three verses my name is there. Christian, love me more than these. Love me more than these. And you put me to the test. And oh God, I hope you know my heart. I love you more than these, more than even the one who is my life and breath in this life, whom I love with all of my heart. I love you, Father. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you more than I love Judy. Thank you, Father, for confirming that in my life, though through a painful, painful experience. Christian, love me more than these. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your instruments.